Okay, welcome to The Guitar Show. I'm here with my very good friend, Dave Parson, and today we're gonna to be looking at the lute and everything about the lute, because the lute was the, uh, was it, was the guitar, did the guitar come from the lute? Well, actually, no, uh, different traditions. The, um, the lute uh, has its origin in the Moorish occupation of Spain from 711 to 1498, and they brought with them an instrument which is still played today in North Africa, the oud. And, of course, the oud is played with a quill or a plectrum. And uh, the European lute evolved from that. Uh, but as you'll see on the lute, this is a typical lute from the 16th century. It has frets, where, of course, the oud doesn't. Um, and these are tied on. They're not fixed like a modern guitar. And um, a very different technique to the modern classical guitar as well. So what you're saying, Dave, is that the oud kind of influenced the guitar in Spain... Yeah. But the lute is a direct descendant from the yeah. oud. Yeah, that's right. The European lute, is, and that's where it originally starts. And then you have um, the technique and the music are always intertwined. And uh, as you'll see later, the lute went on as one of the most popular court instruments for 300 years and constantly evolved. And so this instrument I'm playing here has uh, seven sets of strings. The yeah. first lutes might have had five. They're always in pairs. Often the first one is left single, but the rest are in pairs. Mm -hmm. And the bass strings, in order to get a brighter sound, would often have an octave with them. Instead of two unison strings, you'll have the, the bass and then the octave. And these pairs of strings are called courses in the, for the lute. Um, so this is a one I'm holding is a seven course lute. To begin with, five course lute, six course lute. Uh, interesting thing about the technique is I said they played the oud with a quill, and that's how they played the lute to start with. Um, and you'll see paintings of angels playing a lute with a quill. And then eventually they threw away the quill and started playing with the thumb and index finger like that, which imitates the effect of the plectrum. Would you be able to play us a short piece and then we'll come back and yeah. discuss it a little bit OK, more? so here's, here's a little piece by, um, from the Elizabethan period, from the early 16th century, and um, by one of the Elizabethan composers, Anthony Holborn. And it, like a lot of the music of that period, it's based on dance forms. And this is Nalmain. Thank you. It's a beautiful piece. So um, let's just get back to the construction. Um, what is the tuning on the uh, lute? Well, the tuning on the lute, forget about pitch for a moment. This might be called a G lute, but what was the pitch of G can vary a lot according to the size of the lute. If you have a bigger lute, a longer string length, you're going to have to tune it lower because of the tension of the strings, whatever tension, whatever size string you put on it. Um, but the most important thing is the intervals. And the intervals on the lute are the same as a modern classic guitar, or as a modern guitar which is in intervals of a fourth with one interval of a third. But on the lute, the interval of the third is between the fourth and the third course here. Right. Um, whereas on the guitar, it's between the third and second string. So it's in a different place, but it's still the same idea of an instrument tuned in fourths with one interval of a third. So, so what would the notes be? Um, going on this one, we would have G, D, A, F, C and G. And then these bases are called diapasons, and as the lute evolves, as I'll show you later, you get more and more of those. Right, so this is right hand lute technique, makes it very different from a guitar. Um, traditionally played without fingernails, so you're just plucking the strings with the tips of the fingers, and you're trying to get both strings of the course, the pair of strings, at once with the tip of the finger, like that. then 
here, of course, you've got to get them together because you've got the bass and the octave on these lower ones. And the reason for putting an octave on the strings was you would have quite thick gut strings, which can be quite dead, um, have a sort of thud sound. By putting an octave uh, next to it, it brightens it up. And that's how the, um, the basses were always done on lutes, with a, um, a, a thick bass and then an octave next to it. And what about the frets? Do they sometimes move? Sometimes <coughs> they do move, and you can tune them. So these are gut frets, which of course do wear out. You have to change them occasion, but that's not a bother if you know how to do it. Um, but yes, you do move them. And of course that gives you the opportunity to tune in temperament. Whereas a modern classic guitar, a modern guitar has fixed frets. It's in equal temperament. This lute can be tuned, uh, or any lute can be tuned to different temperaments. So I have this to what is loosely called a mean tone temperament. And so the intervals between the notes are slightly different. Um, and you can alter them. For instance, if you played a piece in G major and you really wanted a, a, an F sharp, you can alter the fret there to get a really clear F sharp. Um, whereas if you were playing a piece where you, you're in a minor key and you wanted a really clear F natural, or more likely a G flat, you can move the fret slightly. So you've got a, lo a lot of freedom, because So on this lute, which is a typical early 16th century lute from the style used in England and Italy and Germany at that time. The back is made of yew, the wood is yew, and as you see it's made in ribs, strips glued together like that, which makes the bowl of the lute. And on this one the neck is made of plum, there, the neck and the peg box, and then on the top we've got ebony as the fingerboard, with the frets tied round, tied round it. And then, of course, the uh, the pegs are ebony as well. This is very ornate, this... Uh, this is called the rose. The soundboard is made of spruce, and this takes the maker, the luthier, a long time to be able to carve the rose. It's all done by hand. Incredible. But if you've ever seen um, uh, Renaissance or uh, medieval churches, they often have one large window at the end, and that is also called the rose window, and that's where the idea comes from. Oh, I didn't know that. That's really interesting. And is, is this the maker's uh, <coughs> Yes, that's Stephen Gottlieb who made this one. Mm -hmm. And um, the, what determines a great lute from an ordinary lute is obviously the skill of the maker who can finally carve all the, lute, the, all the woods just right. But also underneath this soundboard are little bars. And these little bars determine how the soundboard vibrates and that uh, alters the whole voicing of the instrument. And that's what makes great lute makers. They can make the soundboard vibrate in just the right way. Amazing. Dave, could you explain a little bit about the music and how to read the music? Right, well, in lute music, we read from tablature. Right, there's a piece of, actually it's in my own hand, but that is a piece of tablature. And many of you may play guitar from tab, modern guitar tab. And um, in the Renaissance period, there were three different kinds of lute tablature. This kind, which is called French tablature, and this was the kind that was used in England. You have letters that indicate which string. So the lines are six lines, like modern tab, that's fine. And then the, the, that A above the top line is the top string without any fingers on the left hand. In the next note, it's a C, so it's the second fret. And then the E is the fourth fret, and F is the fifth fret. Uh, and so it is, it's the same principle, but it's much more sophisticated than guitar tab because if you look above here, you have the rhythms. I see, right. So it's a much more sophisticated form of tab. But um, it did vary, and if you look at, um, this is a piece of Italian tablature, um, it's in numbers. Um, and what you won't know, unless you read it, is it's the other way up. So whereas on the French tablet, the top string is on the top line, in um, Italian tablet, the top line is on the bottom. The top string is on the bottom. Right. So it can be quite confusing. So Dave, who was like the Jimi Hendrix of the lute? Was there a Jimi Hendrix of the lute? There was an incredibly important figure that um, rises above all other 
uh, musicians of the period, which was John Dowland. And if you think of what Shakespeare is to literature at the time, John Dowland was to music. And in a funny way, Dowland's music never got forgotten because he was a great, one of the best English songwriters. Um, probably one of them amongst the great English songwriters. Um, did, did he sing and play or just play? That's controversial. His song accompaniments are quite complex, so it seems unlikely that anybody sang and played at the same time with them. There are songs you could, of course, accompany yourself on the lute. It's a great tradition. But the more complex, um, more classical songs of uh, like Dowland, probably not. But he... Um, was a controversial figure, um, like a lot of musicians are. He, he would fall out of people. He expected to be made. Was it sex, drugs, and rock and roll? My, a little bit. <laughs> he, a little bit. It was. It was, and um, he wanted the job to be uh, the chief lutenist to Queen Elizabeth I, but he didn't get the job. So he went off on his travels around Europe, playing for the King of Denmark, playing for other courts and kings. Um, yeah, but I think the impression he got, he was a little uh, controversial, but brilliant. And his music has never been forgotten because of the songs, even in the 19th century, when nobody played this period of music or would think of playing old music like that. Mm -hmm. Dowland's songs would appear in song anthologies, accompanied by the piano, admittedly. And... Um, so he is a great figure and, and a masterful composer. The little piece I played at the beginning by Anthony Holborn is a dance, and there are many by John Dowland. Um, and the mo he wrote when one of the most famous pieces has ever been of Elizabethan music, which carried on being popular long after his death, uh, called Lacrimae Pavan. And like any good composer, if he had a successful tune, he'd write it in different forms. So there is Lacrimae Pavan for the lute, there's Lacrimae Pavan for the lute and the consort of viols, which was a bit like uh, predecessor to a cello. Um, there is the song, Flow My Tears, which is exactly the same piece, accompanied mm -hmm. by the lute. Uh, and this is the little bit, a little bit of how it goes. That's the first Beautiful. strain, if you like. Mm -hmm. And these pieces at this time, all the dance forms were written in the form of having three strains or three themes. After each theme came a section which was called divisions. Mm -hmm. And so that um, section you've just heard played, the next one is exactly the same, but with many more notes. So you'd get... <laughs> section like that and that's mm -hmm. how it works and division playing was very complicated um, or complex and obviously they were very very good players at the time mm -hmm. and you imagine these dances up to speed they'd be playing very very fast usually with that thumb and index technique I talked about well I'm gonna play another little bit of another piece of down because another feature of, of Elizabethan lute music um, is the, are the fantasies and Darland was a, a, an expert at writing these fantasies which is basically a free piece usually in duple time uh, with contrapuntal ideas one part starting uh, a theme starting in one part of the lute 
finishing in another and then mixing them up. So it's um, improvised. Almost. Improvised yeah. in feel, yeah. And um, they can be very, very beautiful. And Darlan was an absolute master of these. And one other thing I haven't mentioned yet, which is peculiar to English lute music of this time, and it doesn't come in any of the other manuscripts from other countries where the lute was also played, is this system of ornamentation, where you would... Uh, it was almost boring to play a note. You had to decorate something around it. Mm -hmm. um, sort so of like it, a modern blues guitar player. Yeah, so yeah. you would have, a, and one of Darlin's fantasies begins like this. Now, that's a very, very simple opening theme, but in one of the handwritten manuscripts from the period, you'll see it mm. comes out something like this. And um, that was a fashion, almost mm. peculiar to England. Right. Very, very highly decorated. And probably, if it was done really well, you would have heard it, uh, something they probably still do on the harpsichord, where you still, you hear the tune coming with all this mm. decoration like a lace round it, but you're still hearing the tune through the middle. Um, oh. The bad thing with ornaments... Diaphanous, a diaphanous... Of... Yes, exactly. <laughs> and when it's done badly, you're hearing ornaments, but you should almost not notice them. Right. Anyway, here's a little bit of another Dowland fantasy, which is quite lovely. We've gone to the <coughs> final chapter, really, in the lute's history. And if you'd gone to buy a lute in 18th century Germany, mm -hmm. around the time of Johann Sebastian Bach, this is what you'd have come away with. And by this time, this, the lute had evolved from these small little instruments played with a quill by angels, by musicians of these early 16th century, to this instrument, which has now 13 sets of strings. The first two courses were commonly kept single, but the rest double. All the basses, or diapasons as they're called, in octaves. And um, a much larger instrument altogether, a good hard back for volume. So this is ebony in this back of this instrument, ebony with strips of holly and ebony uh, neck and an ebony that fingerboard. Solid, solid ebony neck. Yes. Um, uh, the, this would be ebony veneer. Ebony wow. veneer, yeah. And the back of it is? Uh, the back of it is actually, no, I think this, do you know, I can't swear to that what that is. That may not be ebony on the back, but it is definitely on the fingerboard. And these are definitely ebony strips. From the beginning of the 17th century, the lute became very popular in France and the French looseners experimented with different tunings and called Accord Extraordinaire. And after many years of experimenting, they settled down on one tuning for this kind of Baroque instrument. And this was a tuning of D minor. So the lute is actually tuned to D minor and it's a very far, uh, very far removed from the little Renaissance lute I was playing earlier. Um, also, the technique had altered a lot because no longer were you playing in thumb and index because all the focus is on these low bases. And so you have a hand position more stretched out like that. 
so you can play the basses. And of course, you need a, a different technique, really, for playing the basses. It's a bit like an organist with organ pedals. You have to have a bit of faith that you're going to hit the right one, um, because it is complicated. And also, these basses would be tuned according to the key you're playing in. So when you're playing a group of pieces, you'd probably play a suite in a certain key, that was fine. But if you're playing a suite of pieces in A minor, you don't want to suddenly play a piece in A major, because then you'll have to put three sharps into the basses. Um, so you have to reflect the key signature in the basses that are there. And um, the great Johann Sebastian Bach did use the lute. Um, there aren't any definite suites by Bach for him. There are lots that people think might have been meant for the lute, but probably they were keyboard suites. <clears throat> and also Bach had himself a, what was called a lute harpsichord, which was a harpsichord strung with gut strings, which was, gave the sound of the lute. And um, probably- Think of my ignorance, uh, Dave, should I interrupt you? So Bach was composing pr primarily for the um, harpsichord. Right? For the keyboard, yeah. yeah. For the keyboard. Because yeah. that was pre-piano, wasn't it, obviously? That was. Although, um, and Bach, Bach introduced, um, this is following what I said earlier, the equal temperament, and his suite for the harpsichord for the keyboard, the well-tempered clavier, is to demonstrate the, how wonderful uh, equal temperament was. Because although none of the intervals are perfect in our equal temperament, it gives you the freedom to move between different keys. And that had always been a problem. So there is a lute repertoire by Bach. Some of it's controversial whether it was meant for the lute or not, uh, but it does exist. But at the same time as Bach, there was a great composer, uh, Silvius Leopold Weiss, who um, made the lute incredibly popular in Germany and was an obviously a virtuosic musician, but also a great composer. And Bach thought highly enough of Weiss's music to use some of it. He There's a violin sonata by Bach, which is actually a sonata by Weiss, which he took and turned it into a piece for violin and continuo. So here's a, here's a little bit of um, music for this kind of instrument and this tuning. Uh, this is by Conradi, one of the German lutenists who was very influenced by the French lutenists, but they made it a little bit more organised, being Germans. And this is a little bit of an Almond by Conradi. There's a little bit of that uh, <coughs> early 18th century style of lute music and you notice a couple of things. One is in this tuning they write lots of what's called on the guitar nowadays campanella effects which is mm. playing scales going across the strings, a mixture of stop strings and open strings right. and that's a big feature of Baroque lute music. Mm -hmm. And also there are certain little uh, tricks doing little rakes back with the first finger is how you do a cadence like that. I mentioned Silvius Leopold Weiss's music and this is probably the best way to hear this instrument. This is the same guy we were talking about earlier who <coughs> Bach was a fan yeah. of. Yeah, an exact contemporary of Johann Sebastian Bach and they worked together in, um, in Dresden. And, and um, would he have been influenced by Dowland's music? No. He wouldn't have that heard music it. was we live in an age when we look back and listen to old styles. I really don't think they did. Right. And um, I don't think they would have had known anything about Elizabethan music. Mm -hmm. And uh, the German Lutonists, um, they mentioned something about the French 17th century style of playing, which was very influential, but in a very derogatory way. They don't want to know. Right. Um, was, this, was, was it more based towards the church? Do you think this music was... Do they church. try and tie it in with the church? No, I don't think the lute music. I don't see it as a... I think it's, it's more religious. of a secular instrument. Right. Um, so I'll play a little bit of a prelude by Weiss and you'll get an idea of how he works his way around the instrument.
Wonderful, Dave. Thank you very much. So, D- Dave, if, if uh, how how would you compare it to the technique of a guitarist? Say, for example, a guitar player wanted to sort of delve into some <coughs> loop music. Um, do you think it, um, having experience on the guitar will help you? Yes, it will. It definitely will because you'll have coordination, you'll have lots of things, but you are going to have to rethink your right hand technique. And in transcriptions of music, the Dowland music and that period you heard earlier can work quite well on the classical guitar if it's mm-hmm. sensitively done. Right. Um, because you've got a six string instrument, and a lot of that music is for six or seventh courses, and you can get around that. Where you get a problem is trying to play this music of right. the Baroque lute, where you've got 13 sets of strings in a completely different tuning to the guitar. Right. And very often, when people do transcriptions for the modern guitar, it just doesn't sound the same. It's not the same music. Right. So, yeah. So maybe it would be better to look at Dowland's music. Definitely, definitely, right. that works better. And um, yeah, all these all these instruments have a role. And um, mm-hmm. then I should mention that after Bach died and Weiss died, mm-hmm. there was a period of what's called galant music, a very a fashion which was a precursor to the early classical period to Mozart mm-hmm. and Haydn. Right. Uh, very simple sort of Italian melodies. Um, I'm not particularly fond of it, but the lute was an important instrument in that as well. And so it goes on um, right almost to the beginning of the 19th century. In and a, is that where, way. and do you see the kind of classical guitar taking over the role of the lute? Definitely. Mm-hmm. The early classical guitar. Um, you go again. Well, that, that was a bit later because what you get after the lute is the, the beginnings of the classical guitar. Francisco Torrega. That's slightly later as well. You get Fernando Saw mm-hmm. and the uh, the first guitar composer who are playing on little guitars, but they are classical guitars. Right. And that's the the foundations of the repertoire. Then later you get Tarrigo, who with the maker Torres kind of redesigned the guitar and make it into what became the modern classical guitar. Mm-hmm. And then of course at the end of the 19th century, beginning of the 20th century, I should say, you're getting the first recordings, uh, Jobet and of course Segovia, who mm-hmm. came along being a virtuoso at the right time with the beginning of recording. Right. And you know, the whole thing became... You- you know what, uh, there's, uh, Dave, there, there's a really interesting concert that happened in the 60s, and I don't think, I, I might have imagined this, I can't remember, but it was Jimi Hendrix and three classical guitarists, and the classical oh. guitarists went on first, and then Jimi Hendrix experience came on afterwards, and it was just kind of like, it was billed as like um, Knight of Guitars or something. You know? I know, and I know what Jimi Hendrix said to one of them afterwards. Did that actually like, happen, that concert? Yeah, it yeah, did. and I know that the one of the guitarists, as he's walking off stage, Jimi yeah. Hendrix was coming on, and Jimi <laughs> Hendrix said to him, real cool, man. <laughs> so, I mean, God, that's a quote, isn't it? <laughs> wow. <laughs> to get that from Jimi Hendrix, wow. But I mean, you know, Hendrix actually listened to Handel. He listened to Bach, everything. You know, because obviously he lived in Handel's house. He did. Well, yeah, yeah he did. Uh, but uh, he was a free spirit, but he listened to everything. He did. He did. And, it, and um, as you all have discussed, yeah, he, he was way ahead of his time. So, because I've always seen, like, I don't know if. You know, I don't really know too much about Dallin, but I, I listen to his music, you know, and normally I remember once you told me because, like I said earlier, Dave and I, we teach together at the CYM College in London. And Dave always says to me, bark in the morning, jazz in the evening. Totally. You know, yeah. And it's nice if, you, if you're making a coffee in the morning and eating a croissant, you put a bit of bark on or some John Dallin, it, it really kind of chills you out, doesn't it? Yeah. It's nice. And then, yeah, I don't personally, I don't want to play jazz in the morning. Right. Um, and uh, it doesn't come to feel really right. I mean, the Indians have this right, don't they? They have ragas for different kinds of day. Do they really? I yeah. didn't know that. Yeah. I'm it's done them for different times of day, music for different times of day. Wow. It makes a lot of sense. Yeah. It makes a lot of, a lot of sense. So uh, thank you very much, um, Dave, for coming in today. My pleasure. It's a real pleasure to have you and uh, hope we've, um, we've all learned something. And um, don't forget to write in the comments if you've got any questions for Dave. I'm sure you can you can answer, can't you? Yeah, totally. You know, Absolutely. So if you've got any questions, if you want to start, you know, learning the lute, or you want to know what um, instrument to buy, you know, maybe Dave can answer um, that in the comments section. Okay, thank, thank you. you. Thanks, Thanks a lot. lot.